people who favor market systems, capitalism, a laissez-faire approach to the economy, a, a small role for government, come under criticism sometimes by others who say that markets, while they are good in their limited application, have some problems. Those problems that occur with markets, they say, we, we term market failures. Uh, the failure of the market in some way to provide us with what we want. I want to look at just three types of market failures right now as sort of a background discussion when we get into our debates about the role of government and the, the economics of the early neoclassical and neoclassical view versus a more Keynesian, uh, neo-Keynesian view. Market failures, very shortly. Not all of them are here, just, just three for now, okay? But these are the three that are frequently cited. One failure of markets is that markets do not provide public goods. Now, a public good, by definition, is a good that, A, is non-rival, meaning that if I use it, I don't subtract from your ability to use it or enjoy it. Think of street lights. When the lights are on, and I'm taking advantage of them, and I'm using that light, I'm not depriving you of their use. Okay? And two, they're non-exclusionary. That is, we cannot exclude people from using that light realistically. I mean, what are we going to say? Hey, you didn't pay taxes to make the lights, to, to put the lights in, so tonight when you're driving, keep your damn eyes closed, okay? That's not going to work very well either. I think one of my favorite examples of a public good is a search, uh, searchlight, a lighthouse. Imagine along the coast of a country where ships pass frequently that there are a lot of rocks and a lot of dangers, and that there's a history of ships crashing into the rocks and going under. And so the question becomes, how can we construct a lighthouse that in shining out on the ocean will warn those ships away? Well, we'll just build it. Now, wait a minute, Moose Breath, who's going to pay for it? Well, let's go to the shipping companies and the ship owners and let them pay for it. Okay, think about that. If you own a shipping company, let's say there's 15 of us, and we say, everybody put in the money and uh, we'll build this, this lighthouse. If you didn't put your money in, would you still be able to use the lighthouse? Sure you would. And so what would you do? You would hold out and hold out and make excuses and avoid every way you could to help pay for the lighthouse, hoping that some of the others who wanted it bad enough would pay for it. And if the, once they got it built, who cares if you owe them money, you can still use the lighthouse and you never had to pay for it. You become what we call a free rider. Public goods tend to experience free riders, or at least people who want to be free riders. So how are you going to build the lighthouse if you can't get everybody to cooperate because you can't exclude people who don't pay? And the answer generally is, what we've done in the past, is government of some type says we'll levy a tax or a fee or something on whatever group to raise the money to build the lighthouse and now shipping will be safe. Well, could a market have provided that? No, because you can't charge people for using it. How are you going to make money with a lighthouse? You can't very well say, okay, we have a lighthouse here and once it gets dark, if you're going by and you haven't paid for the lighthouse, you have to close your eyes. All right? So, maybe in the realm of public goods, markets don't give us a very good answer. And maybe that's one reasonable explanation for why government's role needs to be a little bit larger than Adam Smith envisioned. Here's another one. Externalities. Typically, if I buy something from you, I buy your lawnmower, and I give you cash, that's a transaction, and typically, nobody else is affected. No problem. But what about if you're producing automobiles, and I, representing the public, we are buying automobiles and driving them. Is anyone else affected by that transaction? And the answer is, yeah, when I'm driving my automobile, I'm creating pollution, which affects other people who may not drive at all anyway. Or the children, or the elderly, or the people with medical conditions, okay? So in our transactions, we're affecting a third party. 
That's the externality. This was the transaction, but there was an effect external to the transaction. Is the market system going to hold us accountable? Remember, if you have little role for government, who's to prevent us from doing that? And so when we have negative externalities, we sometimes say that the market is letting us down because it allows for the creation of these negative externalities and no way to constrain them, absent a larger role for government. Okay. So, by the way, just to mention it, there are positive externalities too. Quick example, um, if you send your child to public school and I don't have any children, do I get some benefit from that? And I, Do I get any positive externality? You pay for the kid to go to school. Hell, we pay for the kid to go to school. Um, but it's your kid and he or she gets, gets a good education, becomes successful in life. What's the benefit to me? Why should I be paying for that? Is there some positive externality to schooling the youth of our country? And the answer is, generally, hell yes. Because when that kid goes to school, he becomes a more valuable employee. So if you're an owner, you're hiring somebody who's smarter and more able to work and able to make more money. If he's making more money, he's paying more taxes, he's a, he's a stronger contributor, producer to our society. Hopefully he's more intelligent when it comes to making both life decisions and decisions in the voting booth. So the benefits of, of public education accrue to more than just the student and his family. It accrues to all of us in general. We have a more educated public. We tend to all be better off. Okay? Positive externality. But again, under Adam Smith's narrow role for government, government was, was not tasked with paying for education. So why should I, uh, a private individual with no children, why should I have to pay for your kid's education? And the answer is, well, maybe government should, should you know, require you to pay some of that cost because you're going to get some of that benefit. Okay? Finally, issues of equity. Are markets fair? Are markets equitable? And the answer obviously is not. No, they're not, because people who are more productive make more money and have better quality of life, better standards of living, more toys. Well, if you're not very productive and you don't have a good income, is that fair? And defenders of the free market will say, hell yes, it's fair, just get off your ass and go to work. Get off your ass and go get an education. But hang on a minute. Is it possible that people who are successful tend to build their lives even together with other successful people and maybe build their own little walled communities with their own private schools and they donate more money to big colleges and they donate more money to politicians and the control of the economy and the access to the power and the well-being, the good, good life in the economy becomes restricted to just people within that little community? Does it become more and more difficult for people who start from a bad beginning to break into that wall, to be able to get into that part of the community? Can free markets lead to great inequities, people who are horribly, horribly rich and others, and maybe many others, who are horribly, horribly poor? And arguably, yeah, demonstrably in many societies we've seen that happen. We see it going on today. So is that a good thing about markets, or is that a bad thing? Is that a market failure? And you get into lots of arguments of what are you going to do? Take from the rich and give to the poor? Take away their incentive to work and take away, I'm sorry, their incentive to work and produce and make more and take away their incentive to work as well because they're just getting government money? That's going to decrease productivity. And so you get some interesting arguments about that, but start off with, with the understanding that markets over time do tend to, in the absence of any other government restrictions or intervention, do tend to lead to a growing disparity or distance between the very wealthy and the very poor. And if you don't believe it, go look at something called the Gini coefficient uh, or take a look at the data for, for most developed countries and ask, the more capitalistic they are, do you see a greater distance between the rich and the poor? That is, by many measures, not equitable. Okay? Market failures, just these three, be familiar with. Bye.